All right. Well, welcome everybody to our March uh, webinar for Open for Anti-Racism. And um, as you know, the topic is teacher education, specifically equity rubrics for OER. And we are thrilled to have uh, Dr. Gerald Hill with us today. Um, so uh, primarily we're going to uh, give this time to Gerald, but um, we're going to do a little bit of an OFAR program description. Uh, because we hope that some of your administrators are here um, and perhaps would like to dive in just a little bit deeper. And um, I'm Una Daly, uh, the director of CCCOER and co-leader of this program with uh, James Glapa Grossclag, which I'll give James a moment to introduce himself. Well, good, good afternoon, everybody. James Glapa Grossclag, College of the Canyons here. It's our honor to co-lead this program together with Una and our friends at CCCOER. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. All right, very quickly, we're a national, CCCOER is a national consortium uh, founded right here in California, but working with colleges around the country um, and in Canada on open educational resources to improve student equity and success. And I've been doing that for almost 15 years. One quick announcement is next week is Open Ed Week and it is our 10th anniversary. So our parent organization, Open Education Global has been sponsoring this for 10 years. And this is an opportunity for you to participate with folks around the world. Um, and here's a quick uh, map of who's participated, the statistics um, over the last number of years. And we hope that you will participate as well. Um, you can either submit uh, items, uh, webinars you're having next week, or resources that you want to share more widely. Um, and you can do that by going to the OE Week, oeglobal.org um, contribute site. And we hope to see you next week online as we celebrate. CCCOER has several events. <laughs> All right. I want to introduce uh, Dr. Hill, um, a dynamic scholar practitioner. I, Sorry, Gerald, I need to make sure I, I check my, <laughs> my notes here. Uh, dynamic scholar practitioner, a voice for educational justice and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, in our short uh, time getting to know Gerald over the last few months, we have certainly seen that. His current research includes teacher preparation and academic achievement at Pacific Oats, Pacific Oaks University in Pasadena, where he is the Dean of Education and Assessment. He has 20 years of service as an educator and is have proud to have taught in many diverse populations in a range of contexts, including special ed, middle school, high school, undergraduate, graduate, academic development, and training programs. So he's seen every, every sector, um, and we're just so thrilled that he could join us today. All right. So I want to give you a heads up about um, the webinars that are coming up uh, later this month, um, sorry, later this spring. In April, we have uh, Dr. Natalie Wheatful Lum joining us from Education Trust West to talk about the vision for racial equity in California education. Well, we're thrilled to have her. Uh, we think we may have somebody for the May 6th one, another excellent speaker, um, but that's uh, we're still waiting to hear back uh, on a confirmation about that. And June 17th will be your opportunity as participants um, to share some of the work that you've been doing to make your classrooms anti-racist. And we're all looking forward to that. And I'll, over to you, James. Great, thanks, Una. And I'm so glad to see uh, so many uh folks here uh, introducing themselves in the chat. Thank you. So I particularly we're pleased to see so many uh, uh, administrators and, and, and managers from our particip particip uh, participating colleges uh, here today. I'm really excited about that. So we want to give you a little, little quick uh, overview of where the heck uh, the OFAR program came from. What is it? OFAR stands for Open for Anti-Racism, of course. Uh, and, and, and the genesis of this styles back to spring and summer 2020. Uh, of course, with the murder of George Floyd uh, and, and many other uh, horrible events and, and pro, pro, inspiring protests happening throughout the country, um, we, Una and I, uh, thought, golly, uh, we've been working in open education for a long time. We think open education could, could do something in this moment. What could we do? Uh, and we, we saw that a, a lot of institutions, our own institutions, your institutions, we're not picking out anyone in particular, but a lot of institutions put these beautiful statements on their websites and in letters to the community saying 
you know, you know exactly what they say. This is horrible and we stand for this and put Black Lives Matter on their website and so on. And then not a lot necessarily happened. There was not necessarily a lot of concrete action or support for our faculty who want to enact change in their classroom. So that's really the, the impetus for, for our program. Uh, we believe, yeah, thanks, going to the next slide. We believe that faculty want to take action to make their classrooms anti-racist. And we believe that open education can help in some way that we can provide tools. So uh, the Open for Anti-Racism program helps faculty from the California Community Colleges explore how to use OER, open educational resources and open pedagogy to make their teaching anti-racist. We, our participants learn about anti-racist pedagogy, OER, and open pedagogy in a facilitated online class. Uh, they develop and implement a concrete action plan to do something in their classes this semester, spring term. Uh, we have peer connections, monthly webinars like this, coaching, and a lot of, a lot of support going on throughout the year. And then we are very uh, uh, careful to document the impact via student surveys, uh, outcomes data from colleges and, and, and interviews with, with participants and, and some administrators from, from the colleges. So a lot, lot going on here uh, and we'll certainly share all of the outcomes. We're operating with a very humble and evolving uh, definition of anti-racist pedagogy. We are certainly no experts in this field. We are learning together. Uh, so our working definition is uh, being race conscious, understanding and acknowledging one's identity and social position, understanding that implicit bias exists, thinking systemically, examining the history of a discipline, you know, epistemologically asking whose knowledge is defined and accepted, whose voices are listened to, whose voices are silenced in your discipline, and how do you open that conversation with students, uh, including different voices and perspectives, and inviting students into not only the conversation, but the solution. Uh, that's where open pedagogy would come in. How do you get students involved in crafting a solution? Next slide, please, Una. Thank you. So, so last, so we are in our year two right now, thanks to the very generous support of the Hewlett Foundation. Uh, last year, we were able to support 17 individual faculty from 16 colleges. Uh, this year, we slightly uh, changed the way, way we approached the participation. We uh, were interested in deeper institutional impact. Uh, hence, some, some of the, the administrators are here. And uh, we recruited teams from colleges. We were able to support uh, eight college teams. So we hope that there will be a little bit more institutional impact. And we're doing a little bit more deep dive into student outcomes over time with our participating faculty. Uh, and yeah, again, we're now in our middle of our second year. So uh, next slide, please. These are the, uh, the participating colleges. We're super excited to have all of these colleges from all over the state. You'll see, you know, if you think about the map, uh, we've got colleges from North, Central, and Southern California. We've got large colleges, small colleges, suburban, urban, rural colleges. So uh, we were pretty, pretty intentional about that. And with that background, we are going to turn it over to our uh, speaker for the rest of our time together. Uh, again, Dr. Jarrell Hill, Dean of the uh, School of Education at Pacific Oaks College. And uh, again, he's already inspired me and Una in every interaction we've had with him. So I know you're in for a treat. Jarrell, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, James and Una, for that wonderful introduction. You guys are way too kind. Your check will be in the mail for all those great um, wonderful words of, of encouragement for us. But again, my name is Jarrell Hill, Dean for School of Education at Pacific Oaks College. Um, I do want to go ahead and I will share my screen so we can walk through the presentation because I really want to make sure I leave enough space for us to um, ask questions and to really dive into the work while we're here um, together. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. What I'll do initially is just kind of give you an overview of what we do at Pacific Oaks, since we are a social justice mission institution, a small private college. Um, and I will talk to you about the domains of transformation. Um, and I will talk as well about equity through a critical friends lens. And you know what we're here really to get into is the anti-racist teacher education and our disorienting dilemmas um, project that will be available on an OER 
um, platform as well. So we'll go ahead and get started. But but first, you know, the first thing I like to do as I've been learning more about these things is making sure I do that proper um, acknowledgement um, of the Tongva Nation. Um, I'm in Pasadena, so um, I just want to acknowledge that land and have that gratitude and respect for the people that were here before me. I really do believe in the words of uh, Chief Joseph Seattle. We don't only inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. So I want to make sure that we have the responsibility to take care of the earth, but as well as each other. So it's good to have that energy in the room before, uh, in our Zoom room before we get started. Here is a little billboard we have around town, um, Pacific Oaks. We have four uh, distinct areas of discipline, social work, psychology, business, and education. Um, we've been around since 1945. And the interesting thing about Pacific Oaks is we started off as a children's school. So that really makes us a unique college because we still have that children's school. Um, our old campus, if you've seen Back to the Future, that's where our campus began um, in Pasadena. So we are dedicated to these fundamental principles of inclusion, social justice, and valuing every human being. Uh, we really do like um, having that leadership through play with the early childhood um, education focus, but also the anti-bias curriculum. If you've read anything in Learning for Justice or Teach for Tolerance, as it used to be known as, um, our faculty emeritus actually wrote those social justice standards. So again, um, I don't want to bore you too much with our mission statement, but it's important that we center the work around what the mission is, because we truly do want to live it out. Uh, our goal in the School of Education is to really prepare our students, not only in education, but all of our degree programs to be um, culturally intelligent agents of change that are able to serve diverse communities. So when we look at diversity, um, I don't look at diversity as a way of counting people based on their ethnicity. I wanna make sure that people count. Um, not only are we looking for a diversity of your identity or ethnicity, we're looking for diverse experiences. When we look at inclusion, that's a way for us to widen our circle to hear um, equity of voice, to ensure equity of voice, and to make sure the outcomes count. Respect is really critical in this work because on the other side of the issue, we have to see a human being. And the important part of that is that we have to make sure that we can disagree and be okay with disagreeing, right? We have to be able to get along with people who don't see the world the same way that we do. So we really do emphasize that at Pacific Oaks. We have this culture-centered approach to learning because I really do love Peter Drucker's work. Um, he says that culture will eat strategy for breakfast, and that really is true. If you don't understand the culture, you can come up with the best strategies, and they probably won't be as successful. These are some faculty values. So we have our institutional values, but faculty came together to come up with their values for this culture-centered approach. Um, definitely, we believe in the democratic classroom. Um, my favorite one is caring. Um, I was always told as even as a high school student, you know, your students don't care what you know until they know that you care. Um, building on the strength and authentic assessment, social justice, learning through play, intellectual and moral autonomy. Here's a quote from one of our um, faculty emeritus, Betty Jones. Learning happens in relationships. Caring is required to sustain relationships. So it's so important that we understand building relationships um, when I train teacher educators, I always talk to them about the importance of relationship before rigor. You really have to get to know your students before you're really able to teach them. And before we really, really get started, we really have to understand that context is key because we have some historical, social, economic, and political frames that we have to reference the work in because a lot of times that may determine what the outcomes are or someone's positionality because sometimes policy doesn't always meet practice as we all know. So this is really an invitation when I share with individuals about Pacific Oaks and large groups. Um, really the invitation is for us to get students to know what they were put here on earth to do, right? I think to be engaged in not only the social justice work, you really have to have that awareness in ways that challenges you not only to say it, but to, it requires action. And it really is an ongoing commitment. And we know that you know engaging in equity work isn't a one-time event. It's really a lifetime process. So here are some of the anchor quotes that really anchor the work that we do. Um, I mentioned Louise Derman Sparks, who's one of our faculty emeritus, and this quote is one of my favorite from the many that um, you know that I could have that we could have come up with. But this was done with equity of voice and including 
um, various stakeholders to really take a look at our program before we decided to anchor the work. And the first one reads, it's not sufficient to be non-biased and also highly unlikely, nor is it sufficient to be an observer. It is necessary for each individual to actively intervene, to challenge and counter the personal and institutional behaviors that perpetuate oppression. The second one is from the late uh, Bell Hooks. The classroom remains the most radical space of possibility in the academy. It takes a fierce commitment to let our work as teachers reflect progressive pedagogies. We must continually claim theory as necessary practice within a holistic framework of liberatory activism. And the last one is from Malala Yousaf, and we know her story with the Taliban. When the whole world is silent, even one voice becomes powerful. So as we anchor this work, I want you to keep these quotes in mind because these really anchor the work around anti-racism, social justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it is Women's you know, History Month, so it's great to have three you know, really radical women to really anchor our quotes. Another part, humanity is really central to our liberation. And again, what we mean by this, it really is, you know, we, we have some ideas of meeting people where they are, but sometimes where they are is kind of a privilege with racial bias. So we have to be careful with some times with that language. Um, I really respect the scholarship of um, Nicole Hannah-Jones and she says that language can hide a crime. And sometimes when we say meeting people where they are, could technically be hiding that crime. So again, one of the authors of the critical race theory is Derek Bell. And again, I love this quote here too. Resistance is a powerful motivator precisely because it enables us to feel our longing to achieve our goals while letting us boldly recognize and name the obstacles to those achievements. So when we talk about getting into transformative work in teacher preparation, um, we have a grant that we're working with an organization called Branch Alliance for Educator Diversity. And we have to situate our transformative work in four domains. The first domain is sustainability. The second domain is quality, scale, and impact. So really what we're trying to do is situate transformative work within a critical framework. Here's what it looks like in kind of practice when we look at our framework for transformation, but also we have to compare it with the framework for preparing educators. Uh, Practice-based approach, inclusive pedagogy, um, equitable experiences, data empowerment, the community of learners, because I think that is really, really key where we talk about professional collaborations like this, because we all are learning together and also paying attention to the intersectional content. Right, so that's really important. And again, I wanted to underscore Malala's quote because that silence, you know, even one voice can become powerful. So I do want to um, also highlight Branch Ed's mention or their mission. Um, Branch Alliance for Educator Diversity strengthens, grows, and amplifies the impact of educator preparation programs at minority-serving institutions, with the broader goals of both diversifying the teaching profession and intentionally championing educational equity for all students. So again, I think the important part of this work is we always seek out people who are mission aligned because then it really makes it um, a true partnership. We really do go hand in hand. They are literally family we meet every week to go over the goals and to measure our outcomes so that we can stay on track. But also at some point, we wanna make sure that this work is sustainable. Um, and again, I wanted to uh, again, re-emphasize the four domains so that you can see quality with the definitions, the working definitions of quality. Quali quality, diversity is quality is one of the taglines that we use. We're not hiring people because of what they look like. They still have to meet the standard. Um, when I work with doctorate, um, doctorate students who are completing their dissertations, I know that there is a big push to want to have educators who look like the students in their classroom. And what I try to do is really nudge their thinking to say, that's just not enough to look like them. The second step is the cultural ways of learning and knowing. So it's not enough just to appear to be the same. We have to really understand the cultural aspects. So here at Quality, the programming is, is implemented with fidelity, which is really interesting to measure. There's about 29 different indicators that we measure quality and fidelity with. 
sustainability, quality programming, and sustain beyond the philanthropic support. So again, we're going to make the program where even without the grant funding, we still want to continue on our educator diversity push. Scale, um, quality programming is implemented with all candidates trained by the teacher preparation program. And impact, that is probably the most challenging because sometimes you don't recognize your impact right away. It may take um, many years before you realize the actual impact of a program. There was one story about critical race theory that I was sharing a little bit earlier. Um, and John Turback, who got a grant to invite Kimberly Crenshaw, Richard Delgado, and Cornell West and a group of folks to a meeting. And it's similar to this space here with OERs. Um, what happened in that meeting was they got together to discuss how the impact of law when it's racialized. And after that meeting, Kimberly Crenshaw coined the phrase critical race theory. So what happens in a space, I think, for us to really impact change, change really happens when large amounts of people make small contributions. And I think that's really it. We all are just another link in the unbroken chain of progress when we engage in this equity, diversity, inclusion, anti-racist work. The other piece, I think I, I would be remiss not to mention it, some of the COVID caused disruptions. Um, we've all seen everyone's bedrooms now working through Zoom. Um, we've gotten to know each other. But what I'm noticing is that there has been some muffled communication because the masking and then also sometimes a screen puts a barrier between the educator and the student. But what I wanted to train teacher educators with is being able to sit with the difficulty of the moment when it's okay to not be okay. But that's, we, you know, a lot of times in, in K-12 spaces, they talk about social emotional learning. And I would argue that social emotional learning is academic and social emotional learning or anti-racist work is not a noun, it's a verb, it's not a thing or another program, it's actually a verb, it's an action. It's fluid and it moves through time, right? And it changes over time. So this was something that we really dove into and we wanted people to really understand how to um, really have that critical reflection. Um, I know one of the key standards with the um, anti-racist group here is being race conscious, but that's a part of that critical core reflection, right? And it's your cultural competence or cultural intelligence that allows you to be more race conscious. Cultural responsiveness, we, we all know uh, the work of Gloria Latzing Billings. Um, and again, I think this is really important to highlight that we really have to try to understand the student's view of the world. We have to see it from the student perspective. Um, I would definitely um, elevate the work of Chris Emden when he talks about the reality pedagogy. It's really teaching from the student perspective and that's really important. But the other part here I wanna underscore is framing and reframing our thinking. That's a part of being that race conscious, right? And that's an active process of reflection. And again, these are really um, challenging when we talk about being culturally responsive teaching. You know, there are three main areas I don't think they are in a linear way. I think they are circular like the graphic. Um, number one, teaching must yield academic success. I mean, I think in a lot of spaces with the opportunity gaps that persist over many decades, we haven't got quite to one if we were to put it in a step. Uh, step two, if we were to call it a step, uh, teaching must help students develop positive ethnic and cultural identities while simultaneously helping them achieve academically. And number three really talks to that consciousness. It's your social political consciousness and you are, you're able to critique inequalities. And I really do think it's more circular because these things are all webbed together. I don't think they go into a lockstep position. They have to work in sequence with each other. It's kind of a circular, more of a fluid movement. This is so important when we talk about belonging um, I, I just definitely have to underscore the work of uh, Pedro Nogueira, and he talks about when schools exacerbate disparities through practice, through practices that reward privilege and harm the disadvantage, right? I think sometimes when you talk about teacher preparation, we all have to address our own biases, right? Um, but I think the other, the other part is we have to understand that kids are coming to us and families are sending us their best and brightest regardless of the condition that they're in. 
So what we have to do is kind of reimagine the basic conditions for learning. Um, what I want to underscore here is when you talk about the digital divide, when you have 2.2 billion people who are under age 25 who are unconnected to the internet, that is really going to create some huge um, equity gaps and also missed learning opportunities. Um, we know here in the United States, students who have no live interaction with the teachers are twice as likely not to progress academically or socially, right? We know that, you know, Zoom has been a gift, but students really do benefit from that in-person um, interaction. Also, the adequate devices, mobile devices aren't sufficient enough to provide access to high quality learning. The phones are great, but you can't, you know, you can't really do school completely on the phone. So we really have to reimagine the basic conditions for learning. So when we talk about equity gaps, if we're using technology as our primary mode of instruction, we have to make sure students are adequately supported. But also there's an there's a digital literacy and an equity literacy that has to be reframed as we're changing our modality or we're pivoting our pedagogy. Um, what happens is when you're unable to perform, uh, Bettina Love calls it spirit murdering, right? We know that the body keeps score, but the spirit does too, right? When your spirit is murdered, you're literally dying a slow death, right? Because you're being humiliated. And I think that just, you know, I so appreciated that term because it just reminds me of the work um, in the 60s from Dr. Cornell West. He called it the spirit melting because he was around when you saw the assassinations of King Malcolm X, you know, JFK and et cetera. So he called it spirit melting. And we fast forward to 2019, Latina Love is saying spirit murdering. So it's a really interesting way that we're looking at the equity work from that spirit in our own internal identities, right? So how do we embrace race and equity? Again, we talked a lot about the anti-bias. When I train educators, I say that you're in a classroom full of ways of collecting dots. So imagine your classroom, every time a student does something well, you're collecting dots. So as an educator, you're collecting dots to connect the dots. So what we really want to focus on with our anti-bias work is identity, diversity, justice, and action, right? When you look at those standards, that really does help you get into that anti-bias, anti-racist frame of mind because you're looking at the collective action work. Not only as an educator are you providing that support, but you're also modeling that for your students. So then that really leans into this emergent curriculum, creating that flexible space, right? I know in Shelby County, Tennessee, they have something called a tap out partner. When a teacher is at a vulnerable decision-making point, there's another adult that can intervene to give that teacher a break because we know about the suspension expulsion data and who's disproportionately impacted by, by the data. So again, looking at those, creating those flexible, creating flexible space, but also having a relationship-driven learning environment, right? Relationship before rigor, because kids don't care what you know until they know that you care. And I think what's ever more pressing when we talk about classroom management is peaceful conflict resolution. And this comes from the UN Charter, where we really want students to be able to work peacefully. I think adults could definitely use that too, especially um, at this time, being able to navigate uh, negative issues. Here are some of the tenets, and we know that the media has been, you know, in a tailspin with the critical race theory. There, there are some beliefs around racism. Racism is normal in our society. Uh, I have to underscore the work of Derek Bell when he talks about the interest convergence, basically meaning um, racism actually will lessen when there's some interest, right? When we talk about the mortgage bubble of 2008, well, now we'll use equity to really give people bad mortgages, and then we saw the fallout. But it was an interest for people to be more anti-racist at that time because there was an economic benefit. Also, another belief is race is a social construct. But to underscore these tenets, you have to understand three keen areas. Intersectionality, that's the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, voice and the counter narrative. There is a, um, there's a powerful uh, TED talk that many probably have seen. It's called The Danger of a Single Story. You have to have the counter narrative so that we can really have an accurate picture. And then most importantly, I would say policy, because sometimes policy like voting rights or you know, free and reduced lunch. Sometimes those policies really hide the inequities um, in that particular moment. So again, that's kind of how we would situate 
being anti-racist, you have to understand some of the theories that were tied to critical race theory to really lean into that particular work. And here is intersectionality. Um, and, and again, I'm, I'm not gonna read this verbatim, but again, what I wanna underscore here is looking at the intersection of when you look at race, you can't talk about race and academic achievement without talking about gender, right? Because we know that sometimes there's an intersection between your race, your social status and your gender, right? Regardless of, you know, and Kimberly Crenshaw says it best, intersectionality promotes an understanding of human beings as shaped by the intersection of different social locations. Where are you located socially within this particular framework? But when we look at educational, our education world, we look at this messy freeway and, and most of us in Southern California can relate to the traffic and the freeway therapy that we have to undergo here. But when we look at what's being centered, it's policy. We have the research and funding also is an interesting word. Oh, there's funding. But again, sometimes that language can hide a crime. Are we funding the right things? And then who has the power and influence over that particular funding? And then what about implementation capacity? What about input from the community? And most importantly, what are the outputs? You've been funding billions of dollars towards education, but we're not seeing achievement gaps close. So then we have to kind of rethink the structures that are in place. Here's something here, I just, I'm gonna play this video. This is a, a interesting study with the opportunity um, gap. And you'll see in one generation, the disparity between kids who are growing up rich and becoming poor. And as we sit in this moment, I'm just gonna let this video kind of show you some of the overlooked barriers to racism because these are parents who both have, you know, they probably have, you know, great jobs. They've done everything right. And then within one generation, the students are, their children are becoming poor. And you're gonna see some significant disproportionality around black and white with this. And again, these are some of the questions you have to ponder when you're looking at anti-racist work and you're looking at equity, like what's happening to these boys who are, you know, who are growing up wealthy and they're becoming poor. You know, and a lot of times what happens is that people will say you didn't work hard enough. I just have to highlight the late uh, Dr. Joseph L. White. He wrote a nominal piece about black psychology in 1970 in an Ebony magazine. And he quoted Stokely Carmichael and he said, gosh, if you know, black people are the hardest working people in the country. So if that were the case, they should be the wealthiest. So it's not just about you working hard, right? So there's some other structural things that really create this disparity. So as we sit with this for the next 25 or 30 seconds, it's just, it's, it's, it's eye-opening for us to see the study, you know, out of um, Harvard and Stanford with their collaborative efforts. It's just mind-blowing to watch it. So, so with that, I'm gonna move us along because I definitely wanna leave time for our questions. So here's some of the things that we do when we talk about building anti-racist educators, regardless if you work in a K-12 or a community college or um, an IHE, um, you definitely have to understand the racial realities and they're so complex and they can't be represented by one individual of that particular group. I think when we look at it through a DEI lens, it really allows us to frame it in a different situation where we can look at some of those intersections, right? Incorporating new facts are difficult to incorporate into thinking, right? Because some people are really fixed. We talk about, you know, fixed mindset, right? It's hard to take these new ideas and to incorporate it into your thinking. The other thing that happens is people in the history, like we know that, you know, I think where history gives us a responsibility to right the wrongs of the past, but just because we did things in the past doesn't make them necessarily successful in the future, right? The other thing that I want to underscore here is this virtual isolation, just because we have more time alone being on computers and being working from home or being in kind of a closed space, you know, there is a level of experiencing social isolation. So we really have to take that into account as we're building this profile for an anti-racist um, educator. Um, and we all know the you know, groundbreaking work of Ibram X. Kendi, 
um, to be, you know, how to be an anti-racist. And I really want to underscore this, to be an anti-racist is a radical choice in the face of history, requiring a radical reorientation of our, conscious, our consciousness. So that's really important as we dive into this anti-racist work. Um, and many of you are really familiar with that. And I just really have to just, I'm so excited for my friend Aubrey Evans, who is at Branch Ed, and many of you are familiar with this equity-oriented resource criteria. So as you're examining your own learning environment, these are three fundamental um, points I want to be very clear about, is learner-centered, right? We say it, but we really have to have examples and evidence of what that looks like. When we're looking at things through a critical, critical consciousness or critical lens, and are we being culturally responsive, right? We know the three areas from the nominal work of Gloria Latsing Billings, but I think I also want to highlight uh, Django Paris, who coined the phrase culturally um, sustaining pedagogy. So like now are we responsive? Now we have to move into sustaining it. But when you look at this equity-oriented resource criteria, it really gives you a way to reflect on the materials that you use and you're building on the funds of knowledge and the assets, right? It's it's Donald Clifton's work, if you've done your strength finder, where he says, what would the world be like if we focus more on our strengths and our weaknesses? Simple question, but it's not as simple because we really do tend to, in, in educational spaces, hold up a mirror and show students what they're not good at. So they're educated, they're going through their whole educational career and they're still unclear on what they're good at. That's the first, that's why we have an identity crisis, right? You have to know your identity before you build your vision. You get your identity, that'll tell you who you are and then you have a vision to accomplish the goals that you've set in your life. So having this equity oriented frame really gives us a framework to look at, not only for our materials, but for our environments and our interactions as well. This, this is definitely something here I've seen and, and I, I, I really do believe we have to do Maslow before we do Bloom because what happens with the original inception of Maslow is that kids have to belong. Belonging was really a fundamental basic need. But as we fast forward through all the different iterations of anti-racist work from we know, you know the 1619 project to 1776 through the Civil War through Reconstruction, through the um, Civil Rights Movement, and through now with all the um, George Floyd murder and some of the changes that are happening, schools have had a fundamental shift. And what I call it is schools tend to expect students to achieve, to belong instead of belonging to achieve, meaning when they don't have a particular score, they bring weeded out of classrooms in different spaces. When I think about my English learners at were uh, newcomers to the country, they were actually placed in double block ESL classes and unable to take their A through G college requirements. That was a system issue. So what happens when the systems are racialized, we are creating these barriers that actually are of the systems doing. So again, it's that achieving to belong instead of belonging to achieve because we actually send students to school to learn. They're coming there to achieve. If they're already achieving before they get there, we're in danger of raising a generation that's unwilling to learn. So that's where we have to really be careful and really refocus our attention in teacher educator, teacher education, but as well as higher education. And when we have students at every level, we really have to go back into this. So here is something too where, I've, this is a working paper that I'm working on currently where I'm really trying to look at, most of you guys understand WASC and some of the accreditation that you have to have, but also in teacher education, there's something called TPEs, which are teacher performance expectations. So I've been looking at a way to create a framework where every program learning outcome and every expectation, I have a pedagogical repertoire that the students could master for particular skill sets. So what I wanna underscore here is one of my, just so respect Yolanda Silly Ruiz, I, I really encourage you to follow her work in critical humility. Again, this is something that's circular, but I just wanted to give people a snapshot of how the repertoire would work. Again, they're interchangeable. Critical humility is definitely something that you would see across all domains. The reality pedagogy from Chris Emden, the culturally sustaining pedagogy from Django Paris, culturally relevant pedagogy from Gloria Latsing Billings, and most, you know, and, and last but not least for this particular meeting is the anti-bias pedagogy from Louise Derman Sparks. So as we talk about 
how to build anti-racist educators, we have to arm them with tools and the subject matter competence to be anti-racist, right? So I think this is something that would definitely, you know, in, in the words of Barack Obama, he said, I wanted to bend the arrow towards justice. And when we start to be able to frame things like this, this does lend itself to that possibility. The other thing I, I wrote a paper about student uh, motivation with a colleague of mine, Dr. Uh, Donald Grant. Um, we, we talked about dialogue circles and, and there are three things that we want to do. We want to invite, we want to notify and challenge. And when we put this into that particular context, it really does have people lean into the work instead of lean back. Sometimes there's people who are developing their consciousness quietly. Um, there was a Senator, her name was um, uh, Catherine McCaskill in, in Missouri. And, and there's a story, if you, if you read the promised land from Barack Obama, he talks about when he was trying to first pass the DREAM Act. And he told the Senator, she's in a predominantly heavy Republican area. And he's like, don't use your, you know, I know you're, you're, it's pretty edgy. You know, your, your constituents may vote you out. If don't use your vote unless you're the one that would make it. At the end of the story, he talks about there were five votes short, but she still voted for him. And her response was like, I cannot do that to the kids. She was willing to do what's right in the face of losing all of what she worked for in Congress. And I think that is something that we have to really elevate those voices because we have people that are willing to do what's right, regardless of what the perceived consequences will be. And I think that really is our challenge or our call to action is standing up for what's right. And we've seen that over and over again, right? Because we're seeing this generation, regardless, you know, they're, they're asking for change and they're willing to stand. So these dialogue circles is something that's another way to um, operationalize having these difficult conversations so that people have that safe space to really engage in the work. Um, and, and again, these are some of the actions that we like. Um, I think, you know, history, what we, what's so important about history that it allows us to keep record. We have to raise our awareness, definitely challenge and educate ourselves on what it's like to fight against, you know, racism and discrimination and also, you know, um, other disparities. Again, Kimberly Crenshaw, you, you really have to name it to frame it. If there's no name for a problem, you can't see the problem. And that is so true. The more we start to have names, right? I mean, if you don't know, again, not only is she responsible for creating critical race theory, she created the Say Her Name campaign. And these are two women here where, again, now we're, we're moving, I'm moving more towards the disorienting dilemmas. Um, this is Michelle um, Cousseau, um, was killed by police in Arizona, and it was actually a mental health pickup. And she was in her home and the police actually broke into the house and they killed her by breaking into the house. And I think, you know, sometimes we don't know some of these stories. So I think, you know, Kimberly Crenshaw is correct in saying that we really do have to amplify um, these particular voices and, and Heather Heyer and her, you know, and what happened at Charlottesville. And it's so interesting when you talk about being anti-racist as she was demonstrating in a peaceful protest, you know, she got ran over by the car and I don't wanna relive that for people, but at the same time, when things are racialized, was there enough attention and outrage because she was white? They're like, well, if she would have been black. I mean, what would have happened, right? So those are, when you talk about anti-racism, those are some of the things that we really have to grapple with. So disorienting dilemmas is another project here that we are working on. And it's really being able to teach things that are really have kind of opposing viewpoints. And you really have to explain it to students because what I wanna be clear here about is you don't need education code or policy to teach the truth. So there's no rule against teaching the truth. So when you have a disorienting dilemma, you're not influencing your political ideology on students, you're just giving them the space to make sense of it for themselves. And, and here's the courageous conversation framework that goes along with that disorienting dilemmas. And these are really five, you know, really key steps, staying engaged. You're gonna experience discomfort. I like to say I'm comfortable being uncomfortable. Again, speak the truth, expect and accept non-disclosure, let data lead the talk. So a lot of times we wanna just take, we're gonna take away you know, kind of our emotions, because sometimes, you know, these dilemmas are emotional, 
because sometimes how you feel isn't actually the truth, right? Or sometimes people manufacture things in their mind that haven't actually happened. So that's so important to let the data kind of lead the discussion. Here's something, here is the actual uh, disorienting dilemma. Um, this is kind of the framework. This is kind of the format that we've used with creating this critical reflection and measuring levels of confidence in these discussions. Ideally, this isn't evaluative, right? This is more of an informational, right? This is more constructive. This isn't an evaluation, right? This is more of a developmental tool to be able to get to being very confident when you're having these courageous conversations. So I would expect most people would be confident to non-confident when they first engage in this work, because it's really difficult to really share some of those important um, beliefs and, and factors, right? That you may have held near and dear to your heart. Here's one example of a disorienting dilemma. Uh, you know, there's a shaman who, you know, we all know the January 6th insurrection, and we all know the George Floyd protests. So, you know, the, the, the question that there's a couple things here. There is a differentiated response when you see the police and in, in kind of the militarized presence of a protest. And then you have this kind of non response, right? So sometimes inaction is being racist, but then other times inaction is being anti racist, as you know, Ibram X. Kendi will, will share with us. So the dilemma here is that you know, the, the insurrection, you do have the right to petition the government, but you don't have the right to put Congress in a do and in, you know, imminent danger, and you don't have the right to uh, interfere with the peaceful transfer of power. On the other side, you do have the right to peacefully assemble, right? But you don't have the right to riot or cause a riot. So when you look at these dilemmas, these are some of the things that we have to grapple with. I really like this, this legal terminology of willful blindness because it makes you not be able to plead ignorance. At some point, it's not gonna be enough to say, you don't know that you're being racist because that's not gonna work, right? I think that's really, people are avoiding it, right? It's sitting in a place of power and looking the other way. And I think what's happening is the paradigm is shifting, okay. right? So in fact, the willful blindness and color blindness, all those things are just really, are gonna be unacceptable to um, to a large, a large portion of, of this work, because if you're using colorblindness, that tends to make people feel invisible. So that, you know, that's so important for us to really grapple with these, with these um, dilemmas. And here's one that is a little bit um, more recent. Um, I don't know if you all have followed uh, Matt Perna. Um, he uh, committed suicide. And I felt like you know, he was there in the insurrection in, in, in January 6th, but he wasn't able to really um, come home back to the community, obviously. And his family said that, you know, I, I'll read this quote, his community, which he loved, his country and the justice system killed his spirit and his zest for life. So maybe there was some quiet consciousness after he had done something wrong, maybe that was a way of apologizing. So, you know, January 6th, you were being racist, and then maybe February 25th, prior to the suicide, you were being anti-racist. So what I want to underscore here is Ibram X. Kendi talks about racism, you know, the is perpetrator, uh, perpetrator center instead of system policy center. So again, if you've read a book called Why Meadow Died, that was the Parkland shooting. Um, Alan Pollock did a fantastic job saying, I'm not really too upset, you know, at the kid, the system created the monster, right? If you've gotten 100 calls to your home from the police department, you're 18 years old, and you sign yourself out of special education and go buy a weapon, those were system things that happened that really created that. So again, those are some of the dilemmas that we grapple with, right? And now we're looking at transformative practice and educator diversity. Um, I love, you know, Ida B. Wells Barnett. I mean, if any um, of our um, esteemed women are here who use a hyphenated name, we have to elevate her because she's one of the first, I think she is the first to actually do that. She did not want to give away her maiden name. Um, and this quote reads, burning and torture here lasts but a little while. But if I die, I will, um, with a lie on my soul, 
I shall be tortured forever. Virtue knows no color, and then we're teaching the truth. So again, these are some of the readings that we're, we're really grappling with in our Transformation Center. This is Gloria Latzing's book here, Dr. Tyrone Howard, Kim Crenshaw, um, my academic mother, Gloria Bouti. Uh, you, you can read the Derek Bell work and obviously the esteemed uh, Pedro Noguera. Uh, these are just, just a few that really helps us center the work um, of some of these you know, world-renowned scholars that do anti-racist work. Um, also here, I just, and many of you are familiar with J. Luke, Wood, J. Luke Wood and Frank Harris, who I just so respect those gentlemen for the work that they're doing with race lighting and the Black Minds Matter. Um, again, that's so important too, as we're grappling with that as well in our Transformation Center. And then, you know, Chris Emden, when we talk about teaching and learning from the student perspective, um, he's got Ratchademics is a new book, but this is the one where he really elevates that reality pedagogy. So again, some of the research that's happening that we wanted to incorporate into the transform transformative practice um, at Pacific Oaks and with our branch at Partners, these are some of the things that we're doing here. I, I love this from, we know um, Paulo Freire with the pedagogy of the oppressed, but I wanna go from oppression to hope. And in my mind, I love, I, I think hope is an acronym for me, holding on with patient expectations. So at some point we have to really engage in dialogue because that's a way of us going through the learning process. And it really is indispensable. Um, and, and here change really does depend on everyone. I know history leaves us with that responsibility to right the wrongs of the past. And if we wanna change, you know, change doesn't look for a resting point. It really does look for a launching pad. And then I would definitely um, recommend Aaron Dottie Roy's work using the pandemic as a portal as you start to read some of the work in other parts of the world to see how they're letting things go as they're moving forward. It's like you're thinking back, but looking forward. If you were looking at it through the African diaspora, you would call it Sankofa, because that really is that wisdom of the past to build a better future. Um, here are some additional resources here. Uh, the Center for Education and Equity of African-American Students. Obviously, you know the renowned work of um, Nicole Hannah-Jones, the 1619 Project, Braver Angels, living room conversations and um, I, a shameless plug for my partners who I love near and dear are, are uh, the branch um, Alliance for Educator uh, Diversity. And lastly, just stay in touch. Now we've met, we're all friends. Um, let's stay in touch. And uh, another shameless plug, um, if you're interested, um, next Friday, um, myself and Dr. Uh, Pedro Noguera are engaging in a conversation. He's really going to inspire us all to continue on the transformative journey um, through this anti-racist diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. So I'm just so honored to have the privilege of speaking with him and working with him in this important work. So I hope you've all enjoyed it. Let's make sure we, we stay in touch and, and thank you for listening. Guess I'll pass it back over to James, Una, and Liz. Yes, thank thank you so much, Jerrell. Re really appreciate that. Wow, there is a, a lot there, and uh, I know there's <clears throat> there's a lot for us all to digest and to continue to learn. I appreciate, uh, in particular, the continued resources that you identify for us, and I admire your ability to maintain quotes in your head. I wish I could do that with all the stuff that I read, but man, it just goes, it just goes out the other ear for me. Um, so I admire that. So uh, we are just about at the top of the hour, but- Any questions? I didn't know I, if you wanted to open up. There's yeah, I think we questions. do want to open it up for a few minutes of questions. I'm going to pass the mic to Una and Liz to facilitate the questions. Uh, I do have to jump here at the top of the hour. Yeah. Uh... Thank you, James. Yeah, I, um, oh, amazing talk. And I, I'm so glad we have this recorded so that uh, all of us will be able to go back and uh, review <laughs> some of the great um, information um, that you shared with us, Gerald. And um, will you make the, the PDF of the slides available to oh, us? Absolutely. I will send them to you and, and James. And you all know you're my brother and sister in this work. So I don't, I'm an open book. If there's anything I can ever do, you know, you guys can have that. So don't worry about you know, screenshotting, well, you guys can definitely keep that. Well, thank you so much. I think there's there's so much here that people will need some time to digest it. 
Um, and so I, we would definitely want to open it up. So, um, you know, please unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question or, or perhaps you have a comment for Dr. Hill. There's been a lot of chat <laughs> going on. Um, That's what happens during lunch and learn, right? You have your lunch and you can chat. Yeah, but like I said, I know it's a lot of information and this is, it's not easy. It's a lifelong process. So I know, oh, there's a hand up. Okay, okay go ahead, Christine. Oh, yes. Uh, so thank you for that. So, so I do have this question and we're clearly all motivated, you know, not to be anti-racist. So is, was this, was the goal for you to just remind us about like what the research is out there? and then to keep working on ourselves and deliver um, education and make it sustainable, impactful, um, and manageable. I forget the other, um, the other one. So was, was there ever, um, I don't know if you mentioned this, I was trying to listen carefully, but is there any like discussion um, you know, amongst people who do this OFAR work, like why curriculum has been racist? Like is there, because I do embrace theory quite a bit. And one of the things um, I always, I seek out and I've, I always, and I found some already, but there's no theoretical explanation as to why this is even needed now. Like when it started, you see what I'm saying? I mean, you can talk about system, system and structure, absolutely, right? And, but racism is never really the only explanation. It definitely is a dominant explanation, but is there any um, room or space that you, you and your colleagues um, have made to explain the theoretical foundation as to why the curriculum has been racist from English to math? Ooh, that that you're, that's an excellent question. And yes, there's a lot of work. Um, Kathy Ye is at um, Chapman University, who's a math expert in this work too. But what I can share with you is what happens is some people are doing what they're taught, right? You know, it's, it's you know, until you know better, you can't do better. So we don't have diversity of textbook selection, right? So what happens is you're hearing everything is, it's written to a bias and you have biased outcomes. So what happens is when you don't have the diversity of authorship in the academic space, you have these really narrow views of, you know, what instruction should look like and who am I targeting? If it's based in positionality to a white middle-class family, like that, that's gonna be different, right? When you come into a Latinx household and you have extended family there, that house isn't in chaos, that's just how they live. But if, you, if you're not seeing it with a cultural eye, you're gonna have a misunderstanding, right? So I think that's one of the bigger challenges with just the authorship, when you look at who, who you're selecting. So that's why when you talk about banning books, that's a part of the infrastructure trying to combat the changes that are so necessary. So I think, like I said, this is a really deep conversation. So there is a lot of work around that. And I really do try to elevate diverse authorship from people that, aren't as red as I think they should be. Just to give you that, that's the, the, word, the word I'm looking for is a counter narrative. Hey, have we looked at math from this perspective, right? Erin Dotty Roy is in India, like to talk to, about her work, right? So th that would be my, my um, comment to that particular question. Thank you. Um, yeah, we've had um, some questions come in from the chat, which I'm happy to relate, um, but Please do feel free to uh, to unmute yourself. Uh, Donna asked, uh, "Why are legislators continuing to control what children learn in school?" <laughs> Ooh, uh, Donna, <laughs> Donna is definitely a, a revolutionary, and, and I appreciate that. You know Sorry, what it is? I a, really that was a rhetorical question. It was to oh, answer. Okay. It was to answer Christine. <laughs> like why? Well, because of control and power and maintaining oppressive systems. Yeah, well, absolutely. If I could, but if I could offer a counter argument, though, but see, that's the thing, too, right? The part about the legislators having power. One of the things I read called Many Other Crimes was centered on McCarthyism. Mm -hmm. Now, what was very interesting about that theory is, is that it during the height of McCarthyism, which, of course, was decades long, was not even just when McCarthy was senator. They actually targeted educators that were anti-racist and anti-sexist and anti-homophobic as well. But mm -hmm. because they exerted pressure on the curriculum, on the professors, all the teachers, that they purposely did not talk about race. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Now, that was the most fascinating sense of, wow, at one point, because at one point, the curriculum was anti-racist up until the 60s, which explained all the students that were, you know, protesting against the racism of the Vietnam War, you know, and the sexism. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and even when at the time that was the Chicano, Chicana um, revolution as well. And you also had the young lords of Puerto Ricans um, in New York that was also fighting um, for racial equality. And not to mention, you had the Native Americans who took over Alcatraz. So mm-hmm. fast forward, many other crimes. She's a Harvard professor sir or she wrote her dissertation at Harvard, I forget. But it was most fascinating because theoretically what she was saying is, is that all the professors who were race scholars and gender scholars and sexu- sexuality scholars and class, because they don't want them to talk about class at all because that's the common ground, that it is because that they were worried about their livelihood and federal imprisonment that they purposely did not talk about race at all. It was the most compelling, even Betty Friedan, you know, the feminine mystique, her common criticism is that she, she didn't talk about Black women. She did not talk about Black women, but this one scholar named Horowitz looked at her work. She was under a lot of pressure from the federal government. She was under threat of being persecuted and being imprisoned for it. So that is why Brady Friedan, who was a race scholar, did not talk about Black women and their plight in American society because she was worried about being arrested. So back to this question about why legislators having power. Now, that's a theoretical explanation as to to why at one point you did have race scholars at one point it changed after the 1960s but anyways i'm sorry really get a chance to dialogue about like theory so i was i just couldn't help but jump on that but that's the last thing i'll say i promise yeah i think you guys are definitely spot on with that but i think the other piece too when you talk about it being racist when um, there's an opportunity gap and you don't have the adequate textbooks and supports that kind of perpetuates it too. Like you, you just, you go into schools when you feel like kids don't deserve an education, you can go look at some of the places, right? That is another part. And you can hide racism with tax cut or redlining. And that's a whole nother reason for some of the challenges. Because then when you raise the taxes in poor neighborhoods, it's not that they're not doing their contribution, right? It's just that they're not getting the support. And then why, you know, the teachers who wanna go in the inner city, they're paid significantly less. So there's two reasons that people don't go into teaching. It's poor work conditions and ineffective leadership. And we know that. So those are some of the things that we have to grapple with. Are there, are there other questions? Um, yes, uh, well, no, there was, uh, thank you, Liz. For, for, we, we have a survey that we'd like all of you who uh, were able to attend today to take. It's a very short survey. Um, I think it's three questions just asking you um, if this was a meaningful um, presentation for you and your work today, which I think for uh, all of you probably, <laughs> that is uh, true. And then we ask you how you're going to apply it. So it's very quick. We've been doing that with all of our sessions um, this this spring. And I don't see any, let's see, I don't see any other questions, but once again, we can, you can unmute and speak up if you would like. And there's so many uh, testimonials in here to uh, your sharing with us today, mm-hmm. Dr. Hill. Uh, this has been extremely valuable. Um, and I, I know that yeah. myself, I imagine many of us will will listen to this recording again. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, there isn't one cookie cutter way. There's no clear path to it, right? Like when you have people say you can make progress on peace, but you're still bombing someone. So I just don't know if that's, you know, you can't do that. And this work is like that too, because you can't look at one individual situation and categorize it. Every place is different. I mean, in my city with three different school, three different communities, you have well, wealthy people and you have people in poverty. It's going to always have that, you know, this just our job to keep pushing forward, really. And, and I think the last thing I'll say, I know you guys are jumping onto a meeting, is that, you know, in this work, you're constantly going to keep pushing towards it. You're going to constantly keep learning and unlearning the things that you thought you knew. So the other thing that I do is I urge people to have them to thank people that help them learn the things better they thought they knew. Because sometimes we think we have it and they were like, oh, I never considered that particular piece of information. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, thank you so much. And I particularly was impressed with, uh, you reached back into the 60s, uh, um, you know, which is now good gravy. That's uh, yeah. 50, 60 years ago. 
yeah. um, and that scholarship that mm -hmm. um, really resonates today. So I was yeah, very absolutely. impressed with that. Very good. Excellent. Well, thank you all for listening and, and continue on in the work. And, and it's good to be with you all. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Yeah. You guys stay well.